Hi, this is Andrew Gums. Uh, this is episode six of the Artificial Intelligence and Cyber Surgery podcast. I'm the editor in chief of a journal called Artificial Intelligence Surgery, here with my co host, uh, Dr. Vincent Grasso. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's Dr. Vincent Grasso here. Uh, excited to have our, our, our sixth guest on. Um, as, as Dr. Gums said, uh, this is uh, the AI journal uh, Cyber Surgery podcast. We are the only uh, medical journal, surgical journal dedicated to artificial intelligence. So this is a very exciting time for us and uh, welcome Paul, Paul to our podcast. So yeah, Paul, we, uh, we met through, um, through some, uh, through Moon Surgical actually. So, you know, we've, we've already talked before, but Vincent, uh, this is the first time that you're, you're meeting Paul. So Paul, I was hoping you could tell, you could tell us and whoever's listening uh, who you are and uh, why surgeons who are inventors like, uh, like Vincent and I should get to know someone like you. Sure, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on as a guest. I uh, appreciate it, uh, Andrew and Vincent. So um, yeah, just quickly, my name is Paul Grand. I'm the CEO of MedTech Innovator. We're an accelerator, but we're um, what I would call a downstream accelerator, uh, meaning that we're not looking for people who just have an idea um, and are looking to then figure out how to start a company. We're looking for people who are up and running and who have a company of some kind. Um, it could be super early days, that's fine, but we're looking for people who actually have um, something that is, is what I would say um, is, is established, meaning generally that you've got um, prototypes, um, maybe even some early evidence um, that what you're working on is, gonna, is actually going to work. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, huge studies. It doesn't have to even be clinical. It can be bench data, uh, you know, animal data, cadaver data, but, you know, we have something that looks like it's going to work. That's kind of the right staging for us. Um, and so I guess, uh, you know, the, the brief version I'd say is that um, we're incredibly successful at taking companies at that stage um, who we, along with a very large ecosystem of people who I would say are best in class, um, around the world in terms of evaluating technology, you know, over four or 500 people that evaluate technologies for us every year. Um, you know, we're very good at, at selecting companies that we think are going to have an impact um, and then providing the right resources so they're successful. Um, and that's why I think surgeons um, who, uh, you know, have an idea um, and some, you know, as I said, are not just an idea, but they're actually They've got some, you know, some efforts underway and they want to see that technology succeed, not only in reaching the market, which is the first thing, but also with the right value. Um, you know, I think that's why you'd want to know us. And, and where are you located and how, so, how long have you been doing this? Yeah, I'm physically located in Los Angeles. We've been doing this now since 2013. So this is our 10th year. Um, and, uh, and, and just quickly, I'll say, you know, in those 10 years, you know, typically you'd see like, you know, maybe a third of the companies or so, uh, you know, actually, you know, succeed or, or still be in business. Um, but in our case, 95% of the companies that have gone through MedTech Innovator are still in business or have been acquired. We had acquisition number 25 yesterday. Um, oh, my goodness. That's an incredible yeah. statistic. It, it is. It's unusual. Um, it just means we're either really good at picking companies um, or we're really good at helping them. <laughs> but, but either way, it's some combination of the two. About how oh, many companies question. do you work with per, per year? And then Vincent, I'm sorry, I'll let you go, but I'm uh, so curious. Yeah, uh, I, so for us, we have multiple cohorts. We have a, um, one cohort that's focused on entering the US as their primary market. So the companies can be based anywhere. We have companies you know, as far as Australia and, and, um, and Eastern, East, Southeast Asia, you know, participating in that, but mainly US and European companies. Um, that's 50 companies a year that are part of that cohort. Um, we have a, a program that's focused on the Asia Pacific markets. Um, that's 20 companies a year. We have a biotools cohort. That's 15 um, companies that'll be in that program this year, which are developing life science tools, technologies. Uh, and then we have a couple specialty tracks, one in plastic surgery, that'll be three or four companies this year. And we have a pediatric track of five companies. So uh, all told, we're, we're talking 85, maybe even 90 companies this year in, in this year's program. So a lot of companies, uh, 420 have been through MedTech Innovator to date. 
I'm 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 speechless. Vincent, help me. That's amazing. Yeah, that's this is this is super for our audience. So the the uh, but you do as Paul as you mentioned, you you um, you engage with companies that are obviously further along than just a pitch deck, right? They've got to have something something working. Can it be a software app, or does it have to be a a hardware you know product or a combination of both? Um, you know, where 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 you know is that of interest to you guys? Yeah, we're of interest. Uh, what's of interest to us, I should say, is um, uh, everything except for biofarm. Um, uh, and as I said, we do do some work in, in that space in, in terms of uh, the enabling technologies, the life science tools. Um, but it can be a software uh, app, absolutely. It can be a software system. It can be an enterprise system. Um, we're trying to do things that are improving healthcare outcomes um, and uh, in economics, ultimately. Um, and we like things that have uh, a patient benefit that definitely is going to be, you know, heavily high on our list. Um, but maybe the thing that, that would be most helpful is to say that, I, you know, I like to say that anything that would be regulated by CDRH, if it's regulated, would fall under us. Um, so, you know, on the medical, the med tech side. So all that health tech stuff is regulated by CDRH. Um, so that's, that's kind of under our banner. Um, and, uh, and then ultimately, the other thing to think about is that we're, we're a bit of a corporate accelerator. And what I mean by that is that we have 27 corporate partners, companies, let's say, like Edwards Life Sciences and Johnson and & Johnson and Beck and & Dickinson and, um, and, and then a lot of the, you know, Olympuses, you know, those kinds of companies. We have 27 partners. Um, and we're looking for what they're looking for. Uh, because they're the ones who are going to be working closely with these companies. They're going to, you know, work very, you know, the companies get to work very um, intimately with those corporate partners. So, um, so if they're interested, we're interested. So, so as you know, I'm based now in Europe. Uh, Vincent's based back in the States. And, you know, I'm obviously American and I've moved to Europe. I'm curious what kind of obstacles uh, you notice or you know, maybe benefits that you notice in Europe and, and vice versa. I mean, let, let's just maybe specifically talk about Europe and, and Asia. I'm kind of curious as the, from your perspective, what the differences are. Well, for the longest time, um, you know, going back a decade or so, um, there was this big trend for, for people to do their early um, work in Europe, um, US companies. I'm saying that it was easier to get to the European markets first in terms of a regulatory path. So uh, a lot of people for many, many years have been going to Europe. Um, that's, that's been going on for a long time. I think that pendulum has swung, um, especially with MDR. And so now people are back uh, in the US. Um, and, uh, and I think that was one of the big initiatives that FDA um, was to make that change because they saw that, that patients were getting market access first in Europe. Um, and, you know, and, but despite that not being the market focus for those companies. Um, and so it's a lot better aligned if we can do our clinical studies here um, and do our early, because people do tend to put their, you know, their marketing efforts to where they get their, you know, their devices approved and to where there's, um, and where their clinical studies have been done. So, you know, I definitely think there's, that, that's changed um, quite a bit, but we still have plenty of companies in Europe Um both European companies and U.S. companies that want to access the European markets. Um, NHS in the U.K., you know, is really interesting for a lot of companies. So we, we see a lot of people piloting there um, and doing, you know, doing work there because they're able to, you know, penetrate an entire system and not just, you know, one small area, which is, the, you know, that's the, the advantage of Europe is that, uh, you know, you tend to have like, oh, you get approved and then everybody can have access to something versus, here, you know, in the U.S., we've got a, you know, kind of a wonky system when it comes to payment. Um, and, oh, yes. and that makes difficult, that makes things a little more difficult and challenging here in the U.S. But the U.K. must be a pain in the you-know-what now that they're no longer in the union, no? Um, I, you know, I can't speak to whether it's, if, if it's harder <laughs> in the U.K. than it was, um, you know, uh, post-Brexit. I don't know if that's, if that's, if it's become yeah. harder um, or not, but I do know that um, that in general, people are, as I said, they're, you know, they're focusing more on the U.S. as, as a market entry point now um, and less and less on Europe um, as well. So, I, I mean, I'm definitely seeing that as a trend. So what about uh, what types of things are you interested in robotics? Do, do you, have, are you guys focused on, on, on really big robotics, on, on handheld robotics? 
um, are, 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 I know the pharmacy departments, they love their robot, you know, just for medication delivery and all this thing. So I'm just kind of, I mean, if you're able to kind of a, a broad idea of, of what kind of interests you or maybe even where you see the markets going, if, you know, if, if any of that's possible. Yeah, well, you'll be happy to know that um, the place in, in, in robotics um, that people are most interested in, um, and this kind of goes for, you know, for all areas, are things that have AI enabling them. Um, that's definitely a thing. Um, and it's not just a buzzword um, that people are, you know, if, if you don't have AI somewhere in your, um, you know, not just your, your, you know, your roadmap or your, you know, kind of like vision, but your, you know, your actual product and your actual work, then it's starting to become suspicious um, right. because, you know, AI tends to be better um, than, um, than typical algorithms for a lot of these things. So, um, so definitely seeing AI all over the stuff you're talking about, robotics, um, et cetera. I think robotics, we're going to see everywhere. Um, you and I talked about that, Andrew, last time, I think we had our conversation um, privately, but that was the, you know, the idea that um, it, it, at some point in the future, I think if there's not robotics involved, um, it might even be, you know, a liability where people say like, you know, why did you do that surgery without some kind of robotic assistance? Absolutely. Um, With some yeah. artificial intelligence oversight. Yeah. Exactly. It's that, you know, I think you, you, you uh, said this when we were talking, but um, it's something I say all the time too, which is kind of like, you know, having that, like, you know, the, those sensors um, and, and, um, and data that's able to say like, oh, there's a critical structure, you know, you were about to cut um, or you're about to puncture. Um, and, uh, you know, and those brakes are there to, to, you know, guardrails to, you know, prevent, you know, the people from doing damage. So like how, you know, how could you not, take advantage of that, you know, like it just, as I said, I think there's a point at which it'll be, people will say there's liability if you, if you don't do those things. And, and that's part of the, the benefits of, I see researchers here in Europe. I mean, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I, but I work with a, with some guys in Germany and they're developing a, uh, basically an intelligent varus needle, you know, to access, to inflate the abdomen with, with carbon dioxide so that you can do minimally invasive surgery. And in, in Europe, they were trying to like get people interested in, in, in the surgeons, the doctors, nobody was really interested in it. And I was like, I mean, you know, in, in America, they're gonna love this thing because just like you said, if something goes bad and you didn't use this device that could have prevented it in America, I mean, that's a you know, multi-million dollar lawsuit. And so, so it's, um, it's very interesting what you say. You know, it's very interesting to me how, how things are different in different regions. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you know of uh, any other insights you can give us in maybe Asia and South America. Are there any things that you notice that are kind of glaring that might be helpful for us to know? Yeah, um, yeah. On the Asia and South America side, um, we're seeing um, tremendous innovation. Um, it tends to be regional and in its not just its application, but its um, it's, you know, kind of a like competitive view of the world. So like we're, we're surprised often to see things that, you know, have been done 13 times by other people, you know, in other places. And yet, you know, people are doing it, you know, presumably for the first time in their eyes, um, in their region, in some of the places in India and in other places around, um, around Asia that we'll see. And we'll say, you know, there's all these other companies solving this problem. They'll go, well, you know, they're not here. And, yeah. uh, and so we see an opportunity. And so they, you know, they're developing their solution that you go, wow, I can't believe so many other people have already, you know, solved this problem. <laughs> um, so we, we tend to see a lot of that. Um, but, and, and, you know, but it's not, you know, someone recently said to me, they were remarking about um, China and they were saying, oh, China, it's all copycat of just our technology. And it's not. Um, it's not. There's a lot of there's a lot of fresh innovation. Um, we have, uh, you know, our annual accelerator program always culminates with a series of competitions um, where our various mentors who've been working with these companies over four months nominate certain companies they've been working with and say this company is really exciting. They should be in your finals competition. And it's a big high visibility thing. And there's awards and you know, we give away a million dollars in prizes every year, um, non dilutive funding, um, which is a nice reason to apply. Um, but but the, the visibility you get in those competitions is really good. Um, and we hold those competitions in Asia, in Singapore. It sounds um, like Shark Tank. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like the Shark Tank, exactly. <laughs> except, except, it's, except it's not like three judges, you know, or four people or whatever making a decision. We let the audience vote for the winner and the audience, um, wow. it's at the APAC Med annual meeting, which is where the senior leadership of the entire ecosystem is in Asia from all across Asia Pacific. Um, and so the audience picks the winner. And this past year it was a Hong Kong company that won. Um, so, you know, it's not, you know, and that was for an innovation for, uh, in that case, it was, it was a company that basically is developing um, a way of getting drugs into the eye without injection. Um, uh, you know, so basically um, enabling, you know, all sorts of therapy for people who today, you know, 45% of, you know, of patients just turn down drugs that would improve their vision or stop some deadly disease process in their, not deadly, but, but, you know, high deficit disease process in their eye, but people say, forget it. I, I don't want those injections. Um, but, um, but now you, have you can talk about COVID and vaccines with that. I mean, I have a good friend of mine who will not get a, an injection. I mean, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. right. Not, nevertheless, no an injection, nevertheless, an injection in your eyeball. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> no one wants. But the point is, so innovation, my, my point, uh, I guess, about, about Asia is this, that all the data is saying that um, uh, Asia will be a bigger market than the U.S. and Europe combined in like the next five years. So, um, so if you're not entering that market, if you're not thinking about being part of that market, it's a mistake. Um, so if you're European, if you're U.S. and you're not looking at Asia, um, you know, I think that's really, um, that's really uh, you know, a, a missed opportunity. And as I said, because the people in Asia are like, hey, the competitors aren't here. We're just going to innovate. They will take over these markets. So we've seen like really cool surgical navigation systems for, um, you know, for brain surgery and all sorts of things where you go like, hey, you know, like there's a lot of companies that have solved this outside of, you know, India and other places. And they're like, well, they're not here and we're going to dominate the market before they get here. And maybe they get acquired by that company eventually. But, um, you know, there's just a lot of a lot of innovation happening, um, and it tends to be that frugal kind of innovation that um, you know you, you go like, I can't believe you developed a, 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 a surgical navigation system for the brain um, that uh, you know took you you know a year and a half and four hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> like right, right, right. and not not, that, you know, not you know, four million dollars, yeah, or forty million dollars or seventy. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy to see how far we always say that every time we look at one of these these companies that pitch us in uh, in Asia, um, we all, I mean almost in every case we say you know it was a fraction, it was a tenth, you know the development cost that we see elsewhere. So so I know Vincent is is, is salivating here hearing you. He, he probably <laughs> wants to save all of his questions for for offline, but but for someone <laughs> for someone like us, I mean Vincent and I, you know. Uh, we create AI solutions right now is what our, our main focus is. For, for, for someone like us, Vincent, what, what should we be asking this guy? What do we, what, you know, I, what can we reveal, I guess, to our listeners? Well, what are some, some good things that we could, uh, we could ask him now? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, selfishly, I have a whole bunch of questions that we'll, we'll have to, um, you know, we'll have to talk to Paul about, but I think for our, for our audience, I think Paul, you would agree. You know, Andrew and I, we're we're physician technologists, right? With some business acumen. Uh, Andrew is very modest. He just finished his master's in AI, and his focus was the use of conversational AI in the preoperative space, which is a big problem, right? So we're surgeons, and you know, there's there's so much opportunity. There requires focus. Physicians have relationships, right, with potential alpha and beta sites. They know lots of people, but they're not, we're not trained in medical school or residency on how to think as a business person, how to take a concept, formalize it, document it, right? I, it sounds like you could be super helpful in, in helping um, you know, people that have ideas, they see market demand, they just don't have the, the ways to put it together. And that's, that's, that's half the challenge, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I'd absolutely agree with that, Vincent. It's, you know, the thing we see all the time, and the, lots of these companies are founded by um, clinicians, surgeons, uh, and others um, who have, uh, you know, have a medical background, and you know they've identified a need, and usually they're able to find some philanthropic type funding, friends and family kinds of funding, sure. maybe former patients, uh, you know, tend to be good sources, right, of, of funding, you saved my life, or, you know, my mom's life, or my wife's life, and I'd love to just repay you. Yes, of course, I'll support your work. So they get they get these companies off the ground, 
Um, they have a small team or maybe even a mid-sized team. Um, and, you know, and then because they're also, <laughs> they're also doing surgery um, all the time, uh, you know, they're busy, um, you know, they're not, they're not probably the right person to be the CEO long-term. Maybe they got the thing off the ground. Um, but the problem is they often make a mistake in choosing their business partners. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, that's the thing that we see a lot. I mean, you hear these all the time. I was laughing about this yesterday as we were choosing. So yesterday we had the selection committee meeting for MedTech Innovators 2022 cohort. And we were going from 150 companies that we'd invited to pitch out of over a thousand applications down to 80 that um, our various corporate partners had raised their hands and said, I want to work with that company. And we can only have 50 in the program in total. Um, so we were going through to, to narrow that list down. Um, and one of the companies, you know, all the companies, we always ask them, how was your team formed? You know, where did you find each other? Um, and, you know, and you see this, I, you know, I hear this anecdotally, you know, and it's funny to actually see it in the, you know, in the company's description. And they say like, oh, well, you know, I was working on this. I was the, you know, the clinician and, um, and, uh, you know, I had a small team and then I met my co-founder on an airplane. They were sitting next to me in the airplane, you know, and it, you hear that all the time, you know, it's the person who was next to me and at the DMV waiting for my, you know, my license and they happen to be a business person. It's the person on the plane It's the person who happened to be sitting next to me at the conference. And I'm not saying that's not those serendipities, you know, don't work, but it certainly means no, they didn't go through a process to say, Hey, here's, here's 10 great candidates who could run this company. And I, you know, I, I went through a process to figure it out. It's the guy in the plane next to you. And you're like, Oh, you busy? <laughs> the guy in 2F. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know we just see too much of that unfortunately we see too many people who you know make mistakes in choosing their partner um and then they're stuck with them and they go around and they meet with investors like me you know i was a vc for 12 years um and we hear this pitch and you know the we go oh my god vincent you're incredible andrew you're incredible um and the work you're doing is really important you know who's this this part, this person next to you speaking for you who really doesn't know what they're doing. And they're like, oh, they were very successful in real estate and they know business and they'll, you know, they'll figure. And we say, no, it, it, we don't want that person, you know, uh, <laughs> running the, they're not the right person. And you're like, well, I've already given them half the company and, you know, um, and, and, you know, and you can, and we tell people that all the time. We'll say, this is, you know, I hope you understand this is not the right, you're not the right CEO long-term. Are you okay with that? You know, maybe right after the funding, we're going to replace you. And, um, and if people, a lot of people are aware and they say, I know I'm not the right person. Um, but a lot of people are like, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I really know business and I'm the right person. And we go, okay, but we won't write that check. So, um, you know, it's just, it's one minor thing, but I'm just saying we, we find all the time that, um, that we find um, companies, the reason I would say MedTech Innovator exists, the reason we exist is because these companies, it doesn't matter where they are, whether they're in Europe, Asia, the U.S., they get bad advice from somebody who's in their local ecosystem. Um, and, um, and, and no one's telling them the truth. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, we've all done this, Vincent, Andrew, I promise you, you guys have done, the, done this too, sure. where we go to these, you know, these kind of pitch formats where like, you know, it's at a university, whatever. And we trot out some, you know, impressive physician or, or a researcher, and they, they give us the pitch on their technology and, and we all clap and go, wow, that was really great. You know, great job and, you know, nice work. And they walk out of the room and we all go, oh, oh that thing's never going to make it, you know, and no one tells the, the person right. the truth that says, wait, you know, here's, we all talk about it after they leave the room, but we don't tell them these five things are going to prevent you from being successful. Um, and so the reason, as I said, we exist is we want to tell the people, we want to find the things that are high value, high potential and tell people what they really need to hear and then give them the right ecosystem so they can succeed. I mean, your company sounds great because you need to help save doctors from themselves. I mean, we, we know it as a group, at least, you know, Vince, uh, I should speak for myself, I guess, but doctors are terrible businessmen. I mean, sure. if there's one thing I've learned is... <laughs> is that throughout my years, it just, just have no concept. It's, uh, so it's really great that you exist and uh, believe it or not, our time has, has already uh, come to an end. Oh, oh my so, gosh, already? Well, I'll, yeah. say this, I'll say this just to be fair to, uh, to, to doctors, 
business people are terrible doctors. So, so we, <laughs> you, know, you don't want yeah. like business and, people. And, and politicians are the worst doctors. <laughs> They're the worst. They're the worst. But I don't want business people operating on me or taking care of my health. So, thank you for yeah. doing what you do. And and uh, there's a role for everybody. But, Paul, but just in you. closing, where where are you located again for our audience? Your your yeah. West Coast so, base. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm based in Los Angeles, but we are non-regionally affiliated with anybody. So the companies we work with are from all over the world. Um, we have no particular bias as to where people are based. We just want to find the most important technology and make sure it succeeds in reaching patients, wherever it may be. Um, you can find me at medtechinnovator.org. Um, I'm Paul at medtechinnovator.org. Uh, and uh, we have an annual program. So, you know, applications always open up in November. Um, but you're welcome to go to our website and there's a little place you can add your name to an email list where we'll notify you when applications are, are open. And we see incredible technology from all over the world. As I said, thousands of companies apply every year. Um, and so I encourage you to apply and reach out. Wow, this has really been really been helpful. Um, so check out our journal at AISjournal.net, uh, all spelled out, A-I-S-J-O-U-R-N-A-L.net. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to stop the recording, but Paul, if we could just talk to you for a few minutes afterwards, that would be great. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.